I was like so thrilled to talk to you. I mean, I am so thrilled to talk to you. Um, and I just loved your book. Oh my gosh. So let's start by talking about uh, 22 Minutes of Unconditional Love and what made you write a novel for the first time in 30 years? Like, how, does, how, does, how did that happen? Right. Um, I have been working on this novel back and forth 30 years. Um, I had my first book had been a novel called Enchantment, which is actually being reissued next week. Um, and it was an autobiographical novel, very many people treated it as sort of a memoir, which it wasn't. And then I got a thought about this book. I've been, I, I've been thinking about this novel forever because the whole issue of obsession interests me, whether it's sexual or romantic or both or, and um, I had always thought to myself when I read books about obsession that the character, usually a woman, I can think of very few books, novels in which the man is obsessed except two. One is called Endless Love by Scott Spencer. And the other is a novel by Alan Hollingsworth, the gay writer in England, called The Folding Star. But otherwise, in my large reading in this subject, it's usually the woman who's obsessed. And what I noticed is the, the, the story usually ends that the woman gets over the obsession, even like Anna Karenina, by killing herself, or in a book like, I'm just thinking, like nine and a half weeks, you know, which was different than the movie, the book, I have to say. She's, you're supposed to think she's carted off to an institution. So I was always wondering, especially since a lot of women earlier in their life, have an episode of, or two of what I would call bad taste in men, <laughs> where they pick wrongly, sometimes strikingly wrongly. And then it's usually that man that they have difficulty pulling away from because the connection is strong, but it's sort of like, instead of connecting to your stronger parts, I think those kind of connections fill in the weaknesses in your own. So I remember going into two editors, this could never have happened today, I must say in book publishing, had I already written this? No, I went in and I said, I would love to write a book about an obsession. Actually, I said that for my first novel, Enchantment, but it ended up being about my mother. And I said, I'd like to try and get a woman into it, and then how do you get out of it? Not everyone drops dead, goes under a train. And to be completely honest about it, I wrote exactly 212 pages. It included the scene, I'll just say it, and I mean, your readers won't know it, but there's a scene toward the end of the novel where her obsession, Howard Rose, a lawyer, asked her to crawl across the floor. I got up to that, stopped dead, thought I can't publish this. <laughs> I mean, this was well before, well, a hundred times before um, Fifty Shades of Grey, which I don't consider a particularly, for me, effective novel anyway. I know it's very, popular. Um, I come from a modern Orthodox Jewish background, emphasis on Orthodox. Um, I'm one of six siblings. And I kept thinking, you know, we were completely observant, like not using lights on Shabbos on Saturday. And I kept thinking of the women in my parents' synagogue, which had been founded by my father, called Fifth Avenue Synagogue. And I kept thinking, what are they going to make of this? The daughter of the founder, most people 
any way, I think, conflate the narrator and the character, especially if the writing is immediate, which mine it tends to be. No one's going to think this isn't her. This Judith Stone is not Daphne Merkin. That truly stopped me. I just thought, I'm not up for the... Um, it was like my inner censor a hundred times over. You know, I think some writers don't have such an inner censor. Philip Roth certainly had very little of an inner censor. Um, but I have a large inner censor, even though sometimes it doesn't fe feel that way, seem that way, because I write a lot personally and fairly candidly. But somehow I just stopped dead. My editor loved the book. At that time, it was called The Discovery of Sex. Hmm. I paid back the advance. I'm recreating it a little. When I look back, I think, because a lot of it I did keep. I mean, I made many, many changes and I wrote many more scenes. But some of the basic essence of the book was there then. Hmm. And I always think then it would have made a complete, uh, would have made me a best-selling, um, but I wasn't prepared to publish it. I stopped, I put it away, went on to write a lot of journalism for about everything from mattresses to profiles of Madonna and Kate Blanchett and Tom Stoppard. I never forgot about the novel. I would always go back to it and try it another way. Like I remember I was writing about a French writer for the, and I was a staff writer at the New Yorker for six years. So I, where I automatically wrote every other week a movie column with Anthony Lane and where I wrote a lot of book pieces and personal pieces. Um, so, what was I about? I'm sorry, just lost my own convoluted train of thought. You I was sorry. No, you were saying you weren't ready to write it, so then you moved on with your life and you became a journalist and you wrote right. all these other things. And, and then I, I wrote a piece about a French writer named Annie Ernaux who wrote a book called Simple Passion. And I thought, okay, I'll try and write this in a more French tone, like cooler, drier, so I tried it a hundred ways. It never left my imagination, third person, first person. I think one issue I truly had was how to get her out of the relationship because I had my own enormous trouble getting out of those kinds of relationships. One I thought I would not get out of. Um, and also, I'll, I'll say what interested me was how far was I going to go with the undercurrent, let's say, of sadomasochism. Mm -hmm. You know, like how masochistic would I allow the woman to be? So finally, I also, in between those years, I wrote about sex to a degree. I wrote essays for the Times. I wrote, I hope you don't know it, but I'll say an infamous piece for the New Yorker on erotic spanking that followed me for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, still does when people, in fact, I got a very good, may I even say rave in the times about the novel. And I thought there again is spanking. <laughs> um, so that maybe would have moved me, you would think, forward. Instead, I wrote two collections of essays. Then I wrote a memoir about depression, my own experience called This Close to Happy. But I had a book contract to do four books. And one of them was this. And I thought, I'm not paying this back again. <laughs> that was one very practical reason. Me Too had it started. You would think that would have kept me, but being the contrarian I am, I wrote a piece for the Times about Me Too in which I 
sorry, I'm thirsty, in which I argued that I thought a lot of Me Too or the tactics of Me Too, the thinking of Me Too, wasn't nuanced enough. That was a piece of, I think it was what we say and what we really think about Me Too. And I talked about that it wasn't useful to look at all men as predatory, all women as Victorian victims. We talk so much about agency, where it's the women's agency. You can also say no, or not all of these were instances of complete, you know, violent harassment. I mean, as you remember, as we all remember, some of these incidents began to seem so subtle and so unthreatening, like your skirt is pretty, or why don't you wear that skirt again? I thought if we stop here, we'll go nowhere else with any issues. So you would think that Me Too would maybe have stopped me, but if anything, I thought Me Too lost so much. What about female desire? We all talk about male desire and how male desire can easily get um, aggressive and unasked, unsolicited. But women have their own desires. They're not, you know, limit, you know, they're not pure as the driven snow. So I went back because this was about that and maybe to appease my sense that it shouldn't be so immediate, but I think it helped the book. I told it in flashback. The woman was already out, the character, married and expecting her second child. And looking back on this obsession she had with, I guess you could call a jerk, if you wanna, but all jerks have their moments. <laughs> so she looks back on it. I don't wanna say so much unless you think, and the scenes in which she's in it are in, like in first person, in uh, the present. Yes. And she meets this lawyer who doesn't make such a big impression on her at a party. She's 30 and a, just turning 30, which is a big deal to her. And she works as a book editor. I and myself, very autobiographically, had worked as a book editor. So it was important to me. I worked as a, in a publishing company for six years, Harcourt Brace Ivanovich. And I remember the publisher saying to me, women don't put enough about work in their novels. A lot of women work and you don't, you don't see it so much. So it was important for me to give her work. And the work I knew best was publishing. So I have a lot of publishing scenes and she's fairly ambitious in her work. And yet this man she meets at a party, a lawyer 13 years older than she is, manages to reduce her almost to a abject little girl looking for affirmation, complete, ex I think also what she's looking for is not really gettable in the end. You can't, no, you're not going to, unless you go back to infanthood, you're not going to be loved in that kind of unconditional way. It either, you're, out, you're either lucky enough that it happened once or it didn't happen. And I think in her case of Judith Stone, she didn't get what she needed from her background, from her parents. Looks for it together with sex, which is potent. And a lot of it is about the relationship. And then at the end, she decides, as I say, she decides by an assertion of will that was an important thought, um, realization to me that people don't suddenly, from one day to the next, think, wait, he's terrible for me. I need a nicer man. Because there's something about that man that's drawing them on. So at some point, it's a decision. I think what took me too long, I don't want to sound like I'm dead now, what took me too long was I kept thinking it'll happen that one day I'll see the truth and then I'll be able to move away. 
but you can see the truth about a situation and still not move away. Within the first minute of meeting Howard Rose, Judith Stone knows he's not good for her. He also makes it clear by calling, calling her bitch when he calls her for the first time. She sees all of it, but she's stuck on him. So at the very end, she makes her way back. And then I do a tiny thing, which I think was partly, I think, a testament to what I would call realism. Also, I think these things, people have long memories of their love affairs. So at the end, she's, am I giving away too much? No, nah, no, but don't give away anymore. I oh, mean, don't give away the ending. <laughs> no. Right. So that's uh, essentially, it's always interested me, this subject. It's fascinating. I mean, what you're really talking about, it's like any addiction, really. You right. know it's bad for you. And it's very clear. Like, nobody thinks like, hey, I think I'll try smoking cigarettes because it's oh. good for me. You know, like everybody knows going into all these sort of self-destructive behaviors that they're not... Yeah. Right. good for them but yet they're drawn to them anyway and the extrication is close to impossible for the same reasons they were drawn in to begin with to begin with yeah um it's, it's but it's interesting it's a even though there are a lot of people addicted to many different substances and people i think it's almost incomprehensible to the people outside it right maybe less these days because there's so much about addiction and about opioid and drug possibly drug addiction is more comprehensible i think emotional addiction mm -hmm. is hard for people to wrap their heads around I because think you're it right. looks so it looks controllable drug right. addiction doesn't look so controllable yep but this and, is like, and you know that with drug addiction, there's a biochemical element. Yes. But with this, this is, you know, this is more subjective and emotional so people can write it off. Right. And yet you're so right. I mean, I think about my life, my girlfriends, like all of us growing up have had someone, not maybe not to this extent, of course, but like right. someone who we know wasn't good for them. And like, you know, and somehow that makes them more attractive, <laughs> which is the worst part it's about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, um, I, I feel I, like I feel like in your book you kept alluding to the fact that this had to do with the love that she didn't necessarily get from her parents. Absolutely. Um, you had um, you had a quote in the beginning where you said he was my mother, I suppose, with bits of pieces of my father thrown in. But to what extent that clarifies matters is anyone's guess. How everything conspires to keep us in the dark about ourselves. Right. No, so, I'm glad you quoted that. I like that passage myself. Yes, she definitely has had, I'll say to you, I also had to be a little careful. I felt careful here because my first novel a million years ago was about an unhappy, affluent, big, modern Orthodox family. I wanted to give her, without making it extreme, you know, she didn't come from direct abuse but she came from neglect, emotional neglect. Neither parent was particularly interested in her. She has a sister who she thinks is more the father's favorite. And she feels, I think, as that, she feels unmet mm -hmm. by both of them. So somewhere, she, you know, the past impinges on the present and I would suppose not to sound utterly simplistic, had she had more normatively loving parents, I think she says her father doesn't know the name of any of her class. Yeah, her teacher. These little things. She probably wouldn't have been vulnerable to that kind of man. Right. Less vulnerable because I think one of the things that draws her in so much is the attention that he pays, first of all, very close sexual attention. She's also sexually somewhat naive. Mm -hmm. She's not someone who's been hooking up, as they say, from the age of 14. She's relatively newish to sex. 
And I think that plays a part, but I think what you read is the most, and even that doesn't explain it, which is why, and. It, it, what you're saying about negative attention, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. It's just like, strikes me as so similar to raising kids, right? When they feel, when kids feel like they're not getting your attention right. as a parent, they'll act out and do whatever they can to get your attention, even if it means you're yelling at them, because that's what they need. Right. So this is just like, it's almost like an adult tantrum, essentially, <laughs> right? These love, these toxic love relationships, not even love, no. sexual affairs are just a way of getting their needs met. Yeah. Um, and I read your memoir, I read it when it first came out, and then I you know, read it again before today. And I feel like obviously there are some similarities, not to make total jumps, but you'd yeah. write a lot about your parents and some of the needs that you feel like you didn't have met yeah. given and how that led to, you know, X, Y, or Z behaviors of your own. And, uh, you know, the more I think about it, I mean, like the minute you said you were four children, I felt envious. Oh, because no, I mean, envious is too strong. Um, Children ever since I've been young, I mean, my daughter has 21 about 21 first cousins. Wow. Because I have- You have five brothers and sisters. And I am the producer of one child. And growing up, I was always seen as the aunt who played with all the kids at the beach. And um, to this day, I find children, I mean, there are people who are different to children. They don't fascinate them, dogs, Fascin- I'm always struck on the street how people get so, f- I mean, I'm not, such a, I'm not a pet type, but like people will gather around a dog and then this is a charming little girl goes by. <laughs> no one stops. So I am very intrigued. If I did life over, I might have become a child psychiatrist because I think the whole process, in fact, I wrote a, might interest you. I wrote a piece for the Times that they asked me to write. It was a show I didn't watch on TV. Maybe it was called The Morning Show that uh, comedian Sarah Silverman was introduced, was interviewed. And she said, in passing, she didn't want children. And she was asked why, and she said she didn't want to pass on depression. So for the Times, I wrote a piece where the depression is inherited about which I know a lot because I've read a lot. And, and the truth is n- nothing, nothing psychological is completely inherited. It's a 50-50 game of genetics versus environment. What you could have is the propensity to get to, you know, it could be, we notice it in children. One child is a little more cheerful, another is gloomier, or however. So there could be a tendency in a child to be more melancholy, unhappier. But if that child gets not ideal, but as best as circumstances allow, they may not necessarily end up deeply depressed. So it's genetics plus environment and that whole duality nature nurture has been the argument of our time and depending what decade sometimes people will stress nature and sometimes they'll stress nurture we live in a decade i think of strangely a lot of emphasis on nature meaning it's medicatable. And I wonder about it looking on. I think it's going to switch again. I don't know. You as a mother would know much more, but I'm always surprised how quickly children are put on um, you know, attention. I, maybe the, the, the medication for attention strikes me as almost the least questionable. But I do wonder about very young kids being put on antidepressants. 
I mean, I'm sure there are the reasons, but. Well, um, I think you should take that envy of my kids and your need to be, your, your longing to be a child psychiatrist and just come like plop yourself in my I living will. room for a while and you can hone your skills in two seconds and then you can revisit that argument. I, <laughs> just like spend a week here and see what you think. Okay, work on it. Okay. You have, how, what's the range of ages of your kids? Uh, five and a half, seven, and then I have twins that are 13. Oh, so. do they get along mostly? Uh, most of them do. There's yeah. some combinations that, you know, <laughs> not as well, but yeah, mostly they do. I think, um, it, it could be worse. There's oh. a, you know, right. They all, you know, they're basically good kids, but you know, everyone's got their issues. Oh. Are, <laughs> uh, the twin, are the twins identical? Boy, girl. No, not identical. And very, very, very different. Different. <laughs> I once did a lot of twin research for a book that I was going to publish. And it you did In the end, the writer didn't deliver. It was an incredible book called The Silent Twins. Hmm. It might interest you, but it's, it's very pathological. It's about two girls, black girls, identical, growing up in Wales. They have a secret language, which twins sometimes have. They don't speak to the other people in the house, to their siblings. The mother leaves food outside their door. Hmm. Eventually, so this will not be the case, they start burning down schools, buildings. I mean, there's obviously fury in there. And they end up in a psychiatric, I'm sorry to be telling you this horrid, <laughs> they end up in a psychiatric British hospital prison, psychiatric prison called Broadmoor. I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't think I was so fascinated by twins, but this book is amazing. Mm -hmm. And mostly it quotes from their diaries, which are remarkable and sophisticated. And they wrote two novels at a very young age. One was called the Pepsi, I don't know why I remember all this from 30 years yeah. ago. <laughs> One was called the Pepsi Cola Addict and the other was called Discomania. They loved America. And it was predicted that they, when they would get out of prison because they were separated, one of them would die. Sorry, I'm telling you, it's, I'm almost over with this horror story. Okay. At, the, at the end of their prison sentence, they were being driven home, and one of them had a heart attack. Oh, no. So, sorry to tell you this grim story, but it led me to read a lot about twins. Wow. Okay, well. <laughs> er erase it from your car, I'm sure. I, I will, I will. And uh, this just uh, enforces my belief that my kids have to come to the dinner table. <laughs> not I, not, not to <laughs> Um, I just wanted to read one quote from your memoir, if you don't mind, this close to happy, because I loved how you wrote about the depression that you went through in such a, well, let me just read it and you sure. can comment after, um, not to get off your latest book, which was also oh. fantastic. And I wanted to just briefly talk about also how you directly address the reader in the book because right. I found that so fascinating. But anyway, um, however, did you fill your days before this torpor came and claimed you? It is difficult to recall how you once went naturally from one activity to the next, writing and reading, indulging in virtual window shopping on the computer, talking to your daughter, laughing over something with a friend, warming up a cup of coffee or tea in the microwave. It wasn't as though you were ever exactly a dervish of energy, spinning from one hectically scheduled event to the next. You are a stay-at-home sort at the best of times someone who has to assemble the internal wherewithal to go out and meet people no matter how open and receptive you seem. But before, you didn't question the whole ongoing shebang of making plans. Now you can no longer figure out what it is that moves other people to bustle about out there in the world, doing errands, rushing to appointments, picking up a child from school. You have lost the thread that pulled the circumstances of your life together. Nothing adds up, and all you can think about is the raw nerve of pain that your mind has become, and once again, how merciful it would be to yourself and others to extinguish this pain. Oh my gosh. That was really beautiful. And so 
just such a great encapsulation of what that feels like. And also, by the way, an encapsulation of, I feel like what we all sort of feel like now, which is like, I never want to go have a plan again for the rest of my life. And like, how am I ever going to go back to normal society? So anyway, I just felt like it was very timely and topical. So I just wanted to read it. I think think this period has brought out in many of us, I think a certain sense of futility, like how do you plan, how do you arrange life if there's this lurking, not known, a, a lurking virus about which in the end not a ton is known yet. One minute it's gone for it's going to go forever. The next is going to return. If you had it, you won't have it. If you had it, you'll have it again. I think it produces not that level of stasis, but a certain frozen in place. How do you plan? And I imagine with children, it is becomes young children. It becomes enormously difficult. Aren't they there all the time? Yes. <laughs> They are here all the time. It's, I mean, I'm divorced actually and remarried. So like now, for instance, they're over at their dad's house. But right. um, aside from that, yeah, we're here. We're, um, you know, the, I, the planning is the worst for school starting in the right. fall because that's all I'm sort of obsessing about in my head. What are we going to do? Is it going to open? Is it not? Right. I mean, you can go down these rabbit holes of, uh, you know. At, and this, just, at this moment, are they ostensibly going to open or they don't know? Well, my four kids go to three different schools um, and they all, two of them, one of them is for sure going to open, they're saying. Two are yes, but might be virtual, but we'll know more next week or the week after. It's just never clear. And then no matter what they think they know, the government could just change it. So um, yes, this period of time is required literally every... (laughs) I feel like every tool in my emotional toolbox right. that like I've ever sought there before ever, it's like all been required to like come flying out yeah. at the same time. <laughs> no, um, it strikes me as it must also, but you know, I am not at this moment in a relationship. It must take a toll on couples. I mean, even good, excellent couples. This is a lot of coupledom. Yeah. I actually, a friend came over who lives out of town and he was saying that his mother's boyfriend, like fiance essentially, um, had to go to the hospital for COVID, but they had been locked in the apartment together for three months. So for the first week, his mother, his mother was like, this is great. I finally have a break. And then after like the weeks went by, she was like, she felt terrible about it. Right. Um, but the beginning was like, oh, okay. Adam. <laughs> so. Right. I don't know. I mean, that sounds terrible to say, no, but uh, it sounds you know. very comprehensible human, humanly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, how have you been surviving this time? Um, it's funny. I just wrote a piece for Vogue, online Vogue. They have a, where my piece was about what helped me through what has been helping me, I say what helped me like it would be over, um, read, what kind of books did I read? So I spent the first paragraph saying, in fact, for the first month, I'm a voracious reader, that is my favorite. I also always read to think, oh, this sentence is, you know, to like continue learning, even though that sounds odd at this advanced point, about how I want to write. So the first month I could not read. I was anxious, distracted, at best. I kept thinking this is the moment I should be rereading Anna Karenina or (laughs) getting through Proust or I'm supposed to be the serious, somewhat intellectual reader. Instead I would get into bed and the best I could do would be a magazine. I'd flip through especially Allure, (laughs) decide I need yet another cosmetic. Um, I also wrote a piece in that period for the New York Review of Books has an online. I wrote two pieces about the return of phone calls. Suddenly I was talking much more on the phone and I wrote 
an actually quite funny piece about beauty anxieties during COVID, about your hair, your nails, that I met a friend in the park, we would have regular meetings and she's a writer and she's not someone I think of as particularly interested in her presentation. And suddenly we stood there and she pulled up her mask and put on lip gloss. <laughs> and I said to her, who's the lip gloss for the mask? <laughs> um, so I wrote about that. I wrote about, I, I teach a class, I taught a class at Columbia's MFA program in writing, how half the time I would put on a sweatshirt over a nightgown. I mean, what were they gonna, they'd see a sweatshirt. Never stick on certainly an ounce of makeup. And one day I thought I'm putting on a little makeup for myself. And I was hastily doing something for five minutes and my daughter lives at home. And I came out of the bathroom and she said, you put on perfume? I said, yes. She said, who did you put it on for? And I said, myself. I mean, obviously no one was going to, but I talk about a lot of things that there was even a so-called black market in getting services, women who came to people's houses. Mm -hmm. Someone told me they knew of a plastic surgeon who was doing, I couldn't believe someone would have, not just Botox, but actual plastic surgery in this period. And I thought, well, that makes sense. No one sees you anyway, you can recuperate. <laughs> but- um, this, this woman um, who I know, who's a mom at one of my kids' schools said that because she wasn't getting Botox, her iPhone like wasn't even recognizing her to unlock it because she looked so different. <laughs> right. That was so funny. No, um, funny. Actually, this morning on um, Instagram, another author, her name's Maya uh, Shanbag Lang, who wrote a great book called What We Carry, um, she oh, posted a picture right. of her, which is so good, by the way. She posted a picture of herself wearing this nice outfit and looking at herself in the mirror, and she said, not for Zoom, not for anyone else, just for me. Right. So that's just what you're saying. Yeah. Um, anyway, I feel like I could talk to you forever, but I want right. to get your advice to aspiring authors before right. we um, Well, I've thought a lot about it because I've taught it for a long time at different, the 90 Seconds to UI. The one thing I have found with young writers more than in my ancient day is there's such an obsession I think partly because of social media, partly because attitudes to fame and celebrity have somewhat changed, to like get it out there in two minutes, when actually good writing requires a lot of rewriting. In fact, I have on my bulletin board, together with the artist, with the photo of Virginia Woolf, a photo of my daughter when she was young. And I don't know why I have a photograph called Ecstasy Girl, not a photograph, a postcard someone called me. I have no idea what it's doing up there, but I have a line by a writer who I've, is not my fa I mean, I'm not a thriller reader or mystery reader so much, but I put it up. He wrote, it's Elmore Leonard, famous. Mm -hmm. If it sounds like writing, I rewrite it. <laughs> He's talking about he likes very simple Hemingway-esque phrases. I mean, I myself like what I always say to my classes is sort of mix it up, have one sentence be short. There's a rhythm. Yes. No one wants to read, I saw him, he looked good, he bought an apple, then I bought an apple. Make a long, you know, divvy it up. Um, not to sound completely truistic or simplistic, I do not know a good writer of fiction or nonfiction who doesn't read a ton. I don't think you can write well without reading. It seems like it would be a natural order, but I think there are people who write who don't read so much. I was also in book publishing, as I mentioned, for six years. So I saw what's 
in the end, as we all know, when everyone says, there are only so many stories to tell in the world. It could be obsession, it could be loss, it could be heartbreak, it could be illness, it could be losing a child, many things. But in the end, even though it sounds simplistic, it is all in the way you tell it. And for that, I would say you should, that one could, should also kind of, this is what I do. I'm not such a big reader by nature of what's called commercial fiction, which is often not particularly well written. Sometimes they can be commercial. In publishing, it's very divided into commercial fiction and literary fiction. Of course, the real division is fiction that sells and fiction that doesn't sell. The commercial fiction sells because it's I had hoped with my novel, I hope I'm right, please tell me, that my novel fell somewhere between, I wanted it to be a real read, but I also wanted to comment on the text in a more um, meta sense, mm -hmm. not a term I love so much, but I think dialogue is hard to do well. There it helps to read how other people do it. I think if you don't give a certain amount of time to it, I won't say daily, because I know writers, who, including myself, who don't write every single day. I should. I write very much to deadline and books. And that's the difficulty of writing also. Not everything is a deadline. Unless you have journalism, you're imposing your own deadline. So in that way, it's very self-activating. If you don't feel like writing and you feel like looking what's on going on on shuttered down Madison Avenue, you can leave it on some level. I think the difference between people who become successful writers or writers who write isn't always talent. Talent is, I think, part of it, but really a big part of it is discipline. And I think that stops people. I think also, one more thing to say, in the end, you have to write because you want to and need to. It's not, as we all know, very few books make a lot of money. If I told you how few, you'd be amazed. Um, I once spoke about writing and Jewish audiences and I said, Jews borrow books, they don't buy books. <laughs> but in that piece, I believe it said, and I think it's true, I should have checked it, that 1%, it's hard to believe this because you're a big reader and you must know readers. 1% of, American, of Americans read one book a year. Meaning many, many people don't read. So in some ways, the writers I know, which is, I think, sad but true, feel they're, they're sort of doing something that's almost like being a lock, you know, that went out of fashion. I mean, there is social media. But that I, think, is a, I think it's coming back. I like to believe that. I, I, I'm so glad. I think so, too. I think there is, that may be one thing COVID has helped with. Yeah. But I people, think. how much TV, even if it's great, can yeah. people watch? And, and reading talks to something else, talks to your interior self. So I also I, think. Yeah. Books. Books are us. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Um, well, thank you so much for this. I'd love thank to meet you. you in person or take you to lunch sometime or something love that it. would be really fun if we're ever out in the world again. Yeah. And um, thank you I for it. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. You too. Bye. Right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.